Um, hi, I'm Mika. Um, probably a lot of you, a lot of you know me. Um, a lot of you have taken my courses before. Um, and for those, of, for those of you who have not, welcome to um, uh, what will hopefully be an engaging semester, despite this move to remote learning for the science courses. Um, I'm hoping that I'm able to engage you enough to get you to get you in, interested in the material and thinking about these sort of critical critical ideas because now more than ever um, is the time to consider um, you know possible futures after this sort of environmental climate um, uh, crisis that we're that we're currently um, in the midst of and so um, with that. Uh, I will do formal sort of introductions and we'll have a, con a conversation and discussion in the Zoom, but my goal is for this semester to upload all of our, um, our lectures to, to the internet um, first before we actually meet so that you all have a chance to, to go through and read those and um, familiarize yourself with the material. And then we'll have a, a discussion, um, a live discussion in the Zoom. Um, which will be about 45 minutes and then a, a short break and then you'll have an hour to um, to sort of finish um, the course. It'll add up to three hours hopefully if we have like you know about an hour lecture uh, about 45 minutes in Zoom and then an hour of, of group work or other sort of work on your own to do um, uh, after that and that'll all happen um, on the day that we are scheduled to meet which is Wednesdays. So with that said, let's get started. This is uh, day one, lecture one for environmental disasters, fall 2020. I start all of my courses with the same set of slides. So for those of you, those of you who have taken my, my courses before, you're familiar with this, but I think it's a really important exercise. I really enjoy doing this exercise. It gets our brains thinking about these critical concepts. Um, so here we go again, uh, if, you, if you've already done this and if you've never done this before. Um, the idea here is that I'm going to flash through a couple of slides um, and I want you to right now take out a, a piece of paper or you can jot it down on your phone or you can open up um, you know, a text editor or a Word document or something. And I want you to just, each photo that I show, um, you know, you can put like the number one for the first photo. Um, I want you to, to, to write whether you think that that photo is depicting nature. It's very simple, okay? So it's either a yes, it is depicting nature, or no, yes and no, yes or no are, are fine answers. So um, the idea here, I'll just move this out of the way, is that we want to really get at the meaning of nature. Is nature the absence of humankind or, or not? Where does nature begin and end? What is natural? What is unnatural? Is there a distinction on the varying degrees of nature? Is nature something that can be managed or unmanaged? Should we protect it? Should we disturb it? Et cetera, et cetera, okay? So these will all inform how we view these photos um, that I'm about to show. And then I'm gonna ask a series of questions. So keep that paper or that Word document that you started handy for when we get to those. Okay, so here's the game. Is this nature? The first photo. This is the first photo here. Um, so is this nature? And to remind everyone what this is, this is the Grand Canyon National Park. Okay. Number two. Is this nature? Um, and of course this is Joshua Tree National Park. Also, the tornado siren decided to go off right now. Um, I apologize for that, but I'm already into this lecture, so I'm not going to start it over. It'll end in a second. All right, third picture. Um, is this nature? Okay, do you think that this picture is depicting nature? This is the Torres del Paine National Park in Patagonia, um, Chile and Argentina. All right, how about this? Is this picture, um, in your estimation, nature? Okay, and this is, of course, uh, baobab trees, very famous baobab trees in, in rural Madagascar. Okay, what number are we on here? So one, two, three, four. All right, number five. Number five. <laughs> is this nature? Beautiful autumnal, autumnal scene here, 
Um, there's an asphalt road here. Um, this is the National Arboretum in Washington, D.C. Many of these trees, uh, I took this photo around Thanksgiving one year, and um, many of these trees are, are, are oak trees. Um, Washington, D.C. does sit in an ecoregion that is dominated by oak forest. Um, so, is this nature? All right, number six, this defaced uh, mountain, um, this, 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 this rock face, which appears to have been um, ruined, uh, <laughs> would you say that this is nature? This is um, Mount Rushmore, okay? Is this nature? All right, how about this? This is number seven, I think. Is this um, cameo shot of my husband um, depicting, in your estimation, nature? Um, and for those of you who have been to Southern California, this is the peak of Echo, what's what's referred to as Echo Mountain. Um, there was once a very grand, bougie, rich, expensive hotel at the top, which burned to the ground about five years after it was built. So now it's a place that people can go um, hike to. All right, this um, sort of mountain, mountainous scene, um, would you say that this is nature? Yes or no? Okay, and this is, of course, Banff um, in the province of Alberta, Canada. All right, how about my hot panting pup um, at Starved Rock State Park, Illinois? Would you say that this is nature? Yes or no? Okay, moving right along. Um, I must admit it's weird to do this <laughs> talking to my... Uh, computer in my office, but is would you say that this is a depiction um, of nature? Uh, this is, of course, Hollywood Beach um, on the north side of Chicago. Um, it's a very famous gay LGBTQ uh, beach. Okay, um, I forgot what number we're on, but hopefully you're you're just keeping track on your list that you're compiling. Um, would you say that this? Is nature yes or no this is the beautiful soft bottom section of the Los Angeles River um, the picture is taken from a running route um, along that runs along the top of the embankment um, the embankments are concrete and the bottom is sand dirt mud trees plants etc all right, uh, moving along, how about this photo? Would you say that this is a depiction of nature? This is, of course, um, a few friends and I in Lewiston, Nebraska, population 65, watching the solar eclipse. Obviously, it was not the solar eclipse at this moment. Um, all right, how about uh, this? Would you say that this is nature? This, of course, the Hollywood neighborhood of Los Angeles. Uh, nature, yes or no? Um, Okay, I think we just have a few more. Um, this depiction um, of, a, of a sidewalk scene, it looks like, um, right outside my front door in Andersonville on the north side of Chicago. Would you say that this, yes or no, is nature? Okay, uh, this aerial shot of the San Onofre, which is now decommissioned nuclear power plant um, in Southern California, in San Onofre, Southern California, would you say yes or no that this is nature? Okay, a scene here from the Ganges River in India. Um, an embankment, what looks like trash, a child um, running along the top. Uh, would you say yes or no that this is depicting nature? Again, another scene from the Ganges River. Um, would you say yes or no that you think that this is depicting nature? Also, this is there's no right or wrong answers here. Um, this is deliberate to sort of get your mind um, thinking in the right sort of right train of thought. Okay, and um, how about this photo, uh, which is a, a coal power plant um, in China? Uh, would you say that this is yes or no nature? Sorry. Okay. Final 
photo. Um, this is a palm oil plantation in Malaysia. These are all um, uh, palm, palm, palm oil, um, oil palms, <laughs> uh, which are used to produce um, oil, which is solid at room temperature and used in many products like Oreos, um, conditioners. It's used as a filler in place of coconut oil sometimes because it's a lot cheaper um, to buy. And so, again, an oil palm plantation in Malaysia, yes or no, nature. Okay, so hopefully you've compiled um, a reasonably uh, thorough list if you need to rewind and go back and look at some of the pictures and, and try and decide um, whether you believe that, that it is depicting nature or not. Please do that in anticipation of our, of our class um, tomorrow. Okay, now I want you to do two more things on your, on your piece of paper or your... Um, your Word document that you've created. So the first one, which we already did, is go through the slides and list whether each photo is nature, yes or no, in your estimation. In your estimation, okay? The second question is, I want you to decide if you, yourself, um, are a part of nature or separate from nature? Are you part of or are you separate from? Okay, and now for number three, there's two parts. Part A, list three to five terms that you associate with the word nature. Oops. And part B, Oh my gosh. <laughs> List three to five terms that you associate with the word unnatural. Oh, sorry. This is with the word natural and with the word unnatural. So uh, make sure that you have yes or no, is that nature, the photos from the slides. Part two, do you consider yourself a part of nature or separate from nature? Part three, List three to five terms that you associate with the word natural, and then three to five terms that you associate with the word unnatural. Okay, and make sure that you come to the Zoom meeting tomorrow with your answers to all of these. If you're not able to attend the Zoom meeting, please send me a direct message on the Discord with your answers to these questions. You can send me like a photo of, the, of your piece of paper or a screenshot or whatever. Okay. Are we, are we all on the same page with this? <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Thanks for the feedback. Um, just kidding, it's just so weird talking to myself um, on camera. All right, so then with that said, um, this is part one. Now part two um, is part two of this, of this lecture um, is we're going to go into whether or not, or what the, what the definition of an environmental disaster and a natural disaster is, and what the distinction between the two is, and actually whether there is even a distinction between the two. Okay, so this is still um, day one, but it's lecture two. So lecture one was um, what is nature, lecture two is... Um, uh, an environmental versus a natural disaster. Okay. Before we get to that, though, we have to start with the definition of a disaster. Um, a disaster is defined by the Red Cross as a sudden calamitous event that seriously disrupts the functioning of a community or society and causes human, material, and economic or environmental losses that exceed the community's or society's ability to cope using its own resources. Though often caused by nature, disasters can have human origins. So this is just a direct quote from the um, Red Cross website, the International Red Cross. Um, following up on that, a disaster occurs when a hazard impacts on vulnerable people. 
So the combination of the hazard, the vulnerability, and then the inability to reduce the potential negative consequences, which is essentially called the capacity, um, this results in a disaster. So there's a formula here. So you have the vulnerability of a population, the actual hazard itself, like a tornado, um, divided by the capacity, the, the, the ability or inability of a community to reduce the negative consequences of, of uh, risk that, that could come from that hazard. The combination of these, if the number is high enough, right, the, the sort of conceptual number, there's no actual numbers here, but conceptually if this if this is large enough, right, so if the capacity is really small um, or the hazard is really big or the vulnerability is really big or vulnerability and hazard are really big and the capacity is really small, right, because this is in a this is an equation, then you have a disaster. And you can also sort of measure, based on these different things, the scale of the disaster. Um, those definitions are all um, linked to right here if you need to kind of to, to double check what I've been saying um, or read through it in a more um, systematic way. All right, so vulnerability. Hopefully you still have those pieces of paper um, from the previous lecture. Um, about nature, I want you to add now to to that to that list, and I'll pull up the word document in a bit um, with your answers to the next three slides. So let's talk about what vulnerability, hazards, and capacity actually are. So vulnerability is the diminished capacity or the capacity of an individual or group to anticipate, cope with, resist, and recover from the impact of a natural or man-made hazard. The concept is relative and dynamic. Um, so what are some things that you would say, maybe three things, that make populations vulnerable? And we'll discuss these in the Zoom, but I want to see what you guys think first. So three things, let's start with three things that would make a population vulnerable to, an, to, a, to, a, to a, a hazardous effect of a disaster. Okay, hazard. Um, so we have vulnerability of populations, then we have hazards. So hazards are just these sort of naturally occurring or technological man-made um, events or high probability scenarios that threaten the security of vulnerable populations and unleash potentially damaging phenomena within a given time frame, period, or area. Um, so what are some uh, types of hazards, would you estimate? So list three types of hazards. Finally, capacity. Capacity is maybe the most difficult to understand. So capacity is like a measure of disaster preparedness. Okay, so continuous and integrated process resulting from a wide range of risk reduction activities and resources rather than from a distinct sectoral activity by itself, requiring the contributions of many different areas ranging from training and logistics to healthcare, recovery, livelihood, to institutional development. So capacity is basically the ability or inability or range of ability for a particular community, whether it be, um, you know, an individual house, uh, an individual person, an individual house, a family, an apartment building, a city, a state, a country, the world, okay? The scale is, is, is not set, not defined. Um, so list three ways that we... Um, let's say as a as a as a as an entity as a community, um, can increase our capacity to respond to hazards. What are some things that we can do to increase our capacity, um, allowing us to better respond to hazards? Okay, list three of those. And then to remind you, so we have vulnerability plus hazard. If those numbers are big, then the, then the numerator is going to be large. Um, and then capacity, so if our capacity to respond is small, then the denominator is going to be going to be small. And so that fraction is going to be large, and the larger it is, the worse the disaster is. Okay. So let's talk about uh, natural disasters versus uh, environmental disasters. I named this course Environmental Disasters for a reason, and you'll see why in a second. So a natural disaster is a catastrophic event 
that disrupts the environment, whether it be the built environment or the natural environment, and is caused by quote unquote naturally occurring forces. This is part of the reason why I had you start this, um, this why I started this lecture with a conversation about what nature is. So some examples um, of a traditional sort of definition of a natural disaster includes things like droughts, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, heat waves, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, tsunamis, etc. In red, I've, I've, I've written out that this is outdated because of climate change in the Anthropocene. And your reading, reading one, um, is going is called um, the end of nature. Um, and it's going to talk about how the line between what is actually natural and what is man-made is getting really blurry. Okay, um, and the, the real the real takeaway here is that some natural disasters are actually caused or exacerbated by human activity. And I would go even further and say not just some, but all um, natural disasters, except for like or earthquakes um, um, and volcanic eruptions, things that happen from within the earth. But everything that's that's taking place on the surface of the earth that we would call a natural, like a, a drought, a flood, a hurricane, a tornado, a heat wave, a tsunami even, um, are being exacerbated by human activity, specifically climate change, but also other things like our, our, our inability to, uh, to um, I don't know, I froze. Okay, I think I'm back. <laughs> okay, uh, sometimes that does that, so. <laughs> Cool. Um, and a case study for this, a really good case uh, study for this, is looking at Hurricane Harvey, and I'll get to that um, in just a moment. But before I do that, I want to talk about sort of the traditional definition of an environmental disaster, because you will encounter people referring to things as environmental disasters um, in the literature, on the news, etc. So an environmental disaster is, is very similar to a natural disaster, um, something catastrophic event that disrupts the environment, but is the result of human activity. Again, in my estimation, and per the reading that you will do for next week, um, everything now is kind of the result of human activity because of climate change, because of our of, of our anthropo uh, anthropocene, uh, because because we're living through the anthropocene and sort of the effect that humans have on our entire environment has changed the paradigm so that there's no such thing as a as a natural as a natural disaster. Um, but traditionally, some types of environmental disasters include agricultural, industrial, nuclear, biodiversity, meteorological, and then I've stuck natural on here because in my estimation, we should just call everything an environmental disaster. And that's kind of the point of this course is to think about everything as a system, think about this moving forward that, that we really do have our hands as humans in all of these different um, things in these different ways that even a hurricane is no longer just a natural disaster. Again, blurring the line between what is man-made and what is natural. Clearly, this is a theme from, from, for this course and especially for this week's lecture and, and discussion. But let's go through some examples of, of what these different types of, of environmental disasters are. So we have agricultural disasters, which include like the mismanagement of the Aral Sea or the creation and the slow decay of the Salton Sea. I will talk about the Aral Sea in a moment just to give you kind of an idea um, of what I mean by that. Um, there are also biodiversity natural disasters, including like the deforestation of Easter Island or the uh, introduction of Africanized bees or the various... Um, uh, bugs that have killed many American, North American um, tree species, such as the chestnut, the American chestnut, through the chestnut blight, or currently ongoing the um, ash tree uh, death due to the emerald ash borer, and also the death of all of the American elms due to the Dutch elm disease. So uh, here are some pictures of that, right? We have Africanized bees, we have... Um, Dutch Elm disease, we have uh, the Dust Bowl, which also could be considered an agricultural um, environmental disaster. And then we, of course, have the, the, the drying up of the, of the Aral Sea. So let's talk about the Aral Sea and what we mean sort of by this idea of an environmental disaster. So the Aral Sea um, is a large inland sea, um, was a large inland sea, um, on the border between Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. 
uh, sorry, or Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. Um, and at one time, the Aral Sea was a, a big, beautiful, flourishing inland sea, um, which was fed by two major rivers, the Sir Darya and the Amu Darya. Um, as you can see in these more recent uh, maps, the Aral Sea has dried up. Um, so here's what happened. Here's a picture of the Aral Sea in 1977, a satellite image of the Aral Sea in 1977, and then a satellite image of the Aral Sea in 2014. Um, so there were two rivers that fed the Aral Sea, the Sir Darya and the Amu Darya. In the 1970s, they were diverted by the Soviet Union to support irrigation projects. Let me move myself over here. Um, as a result, the water level in the inland sea started to decline, continued to decline, um, as water was diverted, instead of traveling through the river and emptying into the Aral Sea, it was diverted to sort of water um, to be a source of irrigation for some agricultural products. So now, in 2020-ish, uh, the sea is only about 10% of its former size, contains only 10% of its former volume, and receives as an input from its two uh, rivers, the Amu and the Sir Darya, 10 times less water. And what the result of this was is that over time, the sea actually fractured into a northern part and a southern part. Um, so the northern sea up here, okay, and then the southern sea down here are connected by a very weak um, trickle of stream river, okay? In 2005, a dam was built on the river that formed connecting the north to the south in an effort to preserve just the north. So here is what it looks like uh, as it's been drying, right? So you can see that this, the South Aral Sea has basically all but dried up and left just a sliver of sea. The North Aral Sea is a little deeper um, and has been dammed up to prevent that water from, from running into the South Aral Sea. So it looks like they've kind of given up on the South Aral Sea and hope to restore the North Aral Sea. Um, what's interesting is that along the southern edge, especially of the Aral Sea, there were many fishing towns, um, which now that the sea has been abandoned, are just weird towns where camels hang out by these like fishing boats on an arid grassland, steppe, desert almost. Um, it's kind of creepy, kind of eerie uh, scene. So I mentioned that Kazakhstan built and then improved a dam at the outlet of the North Aral Sea. So here's a zoom in of the dam, right? So here's the North Aral Sea. The dam is right here, um, right here. And then you can see here, zooming in on this area, here's the dam, which is allowing the water to sort of trickle out of the North Aral Sea. And what this has done is that it is working at preserving the North Aral Sea's uh, size and depth. Unfortunately, the South Aral Sea has basically um, been given up on. <laughs> um, but again, the North Aral Sea is being fed by the Sir Darya and the South Aral Sea is being fed by the Amu Darya. So another possible solution to this is that that um, these irrigation projects could be reverted back to, to whatever they were um, doing before the 1970s. Okay, so that's an example of sort of an environmental natural disaster of the agricultural variety. There are also industrial environmental disasters. These are probably the most sort of famous. Uh, they make the headlines. They're, they're big, um, destructive natural disasters like explosions of chemical plants or, um, in the case of Minamata disease, chemical plants dumping mercury into rivers, which over many decades poisoned a town. You have oil spills like the Exxon Valdez and the Deepwater Horizon. Um, you have Superfund sites and, and chemical plant explosions in Seveso and Bhopal, India. Um, so these are, you know, I think we, we all kind of understand what an industrial environmental disaster is. We also have meteorological environmental disasters, um, including the London smog, um, uh, and, then, and then forest fires, which cause haze, um, which can uh, reduce visibility and, and worsen um, lung problems in places like Singapore and Malaysia, for example, if we're looking at the Southeast Asian haze from 1997 and then again from 2005. Um, and there's a video here which you can uh, watch. I'll post the I'll post the lecture to the Google Drive, and you can go ahead and watch that video um, if you if you 
or into seeing a really sad um, orangutan trying to protect its forest as it's being kind of bull bulldozed, um, bulldozed over uh, by uh, people who are going to light the forest on fire. I think that's what the video is. <laughs> Um, if not, I could be thinking of something t entirely different, but you should still watch this video and you should still read this, this article. All right. Um, and finally we have nuclear environmental disasters, which are infamous at this point. Um, Chernobyl, which was an HBO special. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about Chernobyl in this, in this course in particular. And then more recently, Fukushima, the first nuclear disaster actually was Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. Um, which uh, didn't reach the levels of destruction that Fukushima and Chernobyl did, so it doesn't live in infamy in the same way that the others do, but um, is included kind of in this broad category of nuclear environmental disasters. There's also the um, slow-moving nuclear environmental disaster, which is where to put the waste from nuclear power plants. Um, and that's been an ongoing debate, both here in the United States and around the world. Um, a book that I highly recommend that we will be reading some chapters from when we get to the Chernobyl section is Manual for Survival by Kate Brown, um, which goes very in-depth on the nuclear environmental disasters that have um, plagued our, our, our planet for the last, you know, 50 years or whatever. Okay, so I mentioned that we would get back to talking about Hurricane Harvey and how Hurricane Harvey is a perfect example of how there's no such thing as a natural disaster anymore, how even hurricanes and tornadoes are what I would consider a, a, a form of an environmental disaster. So if any of you remember Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Harvey was a very slow-moving um, hurricane that, that made landfall on the Texas coast and then worked its way through Houston, where it ended up dumping like 40 or 50 inches of rain in 2017. So these are um, station observations, so weather stations where people go outside and they like actually just collect the rain and measure how much rain fell. Um, and you can see that in Houston, in and around Houston and down into Galveston, um, many of these station pick, stations picked up 300 millimeters per day of rain. So let me, let me just do the math on that. Um, oops. 300 divided by 20. So it's like 11 to 12 inches of rain per day. This went on for like three or four days. You end up with some stations reporting like 40 or 50 inches of rain. Okay. Uh, using other sources of data, we come up with similar, um, similar maps using a gridded data set or using just the radar and estimating how much rain fell. Either way, um, the scientific term is a shit ton of rain fell on... Uh, Houston due to Hurricane Harvey. Extreme rainfall. Rain that had never been seen in the city before and probably had never been seen for the past, you know, 1,000 years kind of rain. This led a lot of people to think, did climate change make Hurricane Harvey even worse than it already was? So it's already a bad hurricane, right? I'm not saying that hurricanes won't happen, but climate change definitely made Hurricane Harvey rain more over Houston and the estimates are if you want to you know get into the nitty-gritty I can send you this paper But the estimates are that global warming may have exacerbated or increased the heavy rainfall by Hurricane Harvey by up to 20% So 20% more rain fell because of global warming Than would have otherwise if there was no such thing as global warming it also shortened the return interval of such an extreme event by millennia. So we would expect this extreme event to happen every, like, you know, couple thousand years. Um, climate change and global warming has made this event more likely to happen, you know, even every hundred or even less than that years, right? So the return interval for this extreme event has been shortened, and the amount of rainfall that fell from this event was increased because of global warming. So... While a hurricane, you might consider it to be a natural disaster, Hurricane Harvey and many hurricanes wouldn't rain uh, nearly as much or wouldn't be as destructive or as big of a disaster without climate change. And so because of climate change, pretty much all natural disasters, because of the Anthropocene and the things that we have done to our planet environmentally, um, almost all natural disasters, except again the ones that are caused by like the rocks, like earthquakes and volcanoes, um, 
I would consider environmental disasters. Here is some, some reading material which we are going to return to um, uh, next week um, in a more formal way, but if you want to start sort of getting yourself acquainted with the idea of Hurricane Harvey as both a natural and an environmental disaster, here are some, some references that you can start with. So um, that concludes this, the lecture portion of this, um, and we're now going to move on to the group work portion of this. So um, I will leave this slide up here for those of you that are unable to attend the group meeting, uh, to, to attend the Zoom meeting tomorrow, but we'll discuss this and we'll break into groups and we'll figure this all out tomorrow morning when we meet. So if you are unable, again, to attend the Zoom meeting tomorrow, you've got to let me know because we have this group work, um, which will supplement the other work um, that you were doing, um, answering those questions on the piece of paper. Okay, so let me just return actually to that piece of paper. Um, so for number four, uh, I need you to, rest, to write three things that make a community vulnerable. Uh, so to make a community vulnerable and um, three, three hazards and this is so disorganized, but you know what I mean. You'll go through the lecture and you'll see what I'm talking about. Hazards and then the capacity to respond to a, to a disaster, to a hazard. Okay, so this is the, um, oh my gosh, I don't know, whatever, a mess, <laughs> technology. Uh, so this is, this will be due after you watch this lecture. You should be able to answer all of this and then we'll have the group work tomorrow and I will see you all um, on the Zoom tomorrow. So, okay, great. See you then. Bye.